Rob Venn here, and today we're going to be looking at feminist theory, specifically those of Liesbeth van Zunen and Bell Hooks. So we're going to be looking at theories of feminism. First of all, Liesbeth van Zunen, and the idea that gender is constructed through discourse, in other words, cultural discussion, and that its meaning varies according to the cultural and historical context. The idea that displays of women's bodies as objects to be looked at is a core element of Western patriarchal culture. Patriarchal, remember, means father culture from patriarch for father. The idea that in mainstream culture, the visual and narrative codes that are used to construct the male body as spectacle differ from those used to objectify the, human, the female body, shall we? And bell hooks the idea that feminism has struggled away in the sexist patriarchal oppression and the ideology of domination. The idea that feminism is a political commitment rather than a lifestyle choice. And the idea that race and class, as well as sex, determine the extent to which individuals are exploited, discriminated against, and oppressed. So let's have a bit of background theory just to support this. Remember that one of the key things we're looking at here is stereotyping. This is Walter Lippmann's theory from 1922. We can define a stereotype as a preconceived and oversimplified idea of the characteristics which typify a person or a situation, etc. The attitudes that are based on that preconception. And it can be used to describe any person, though, or thing, in fact, who appears to conform closely to the idea of a type. So, first thing about Lisbeth van Zunen's theory. She says that gender is constructed through discourse and its meaning varies according to cultural and historical contexts. So, for example, if we look at magazines, they construct many traditional representations of gender. So when we think of traditional, stereotypical, feminine behaviours, we think of domesticity, from you know, the home, the domestic sphere, cooking, cleaning, looking after the children, etc. The idea of motherhood, again, being a, uh, a nurturing caregiver to the children and the husband. They should be interested in fashion and beauty, for example. These are key stereotypical traits of femininity. And whilst those can relate specifically to the time and society in which the uh, mediations were produced, things don't change that radically. I mean, here we've got a 23rd of October 1976 issue of Woman's Weekly showing a woman firmly in a domestic caregiving role, baking cakes, presumably for children, novelty cakes pull out, it says, Vintage car, cottage, and some other things I think I'll read. Um, <clears throat> this also got beauty tips. Vaseline intensive care lotion, for example. Now, if you looked at a modern woman's weekly or similar magazine, it wouldn't necessarily have a cover like this. It would have a woman looking glamorous and pretty on the front cover. So, still objectified, but not on a domestic sphere. In fact, it's fairly rare to see women on the front cover of magazines like this nowadays, but we do get magazines like uh, Condé Nast's Brides magazine, which of course you know, uh, represent a particularly uh, stereotyped representation of women, um, saying that they should be you know, obsessed with weddings and all the... What's the word I'm looking for? The sort of like the spectacle and the... Uh, the tradition that goes with it. <clears throat> Interesting to consider the actual um, misogynistic origins of many uh, wedding traditions. Um, many of the traditions we associate with weddings date back to pre-Roman Etruscan bride capture, for example, um, when the main way of getting a bride was to raid a nearing village and kidnap someone. So carrying the woman over the threshold dates back to the time when the woman had to be carried because she was tied up. The idea that bridesmaids originally would have all worn exactly the same outfit as the bride, this made it difficult for any rescue parties to identify the bride so that she'd be rescued. The best man always stands on the right of the groom, so he's got room to draw his sword to protect the bridal party from rescues. Interesting bit of trivia for you. Uh, Liesbeth van Zunen also talked about the depressing stability in the articulation of women's politics and communication. 
she says the underlying frame of reference is that women belong to the family to the domestic life and men to the social world of politics and work the femininity is about care nurturance and compassion the masculinity is about efficiency rationality and individuality again look at these two adverts here the one from the 1970s and one from the 21st century if anything the modern one is worse they both depict women in domestic situations they're both pretty and objectified but the one on the worst left sorry on the right is far worse than the one on the left as the woman is basically there bending over in her underwear so actually much more misogynistic so things don't necessarily get better with time Lisbeth van Zunen also said that the idea of the display of women's bodies as objects to be looked at is a core element of Western patriarchal culture. That women are objectified as sex objects. That there's an obsession with female beauty, which is very much tied to youth. And whereas men, for example, can be considered to get better, more attractive and more distinguished as they get older. Think of your, your stereotypical silver fox. You know, look at someone like um, uh, would be a good example of a silver fox. Somebody like um, George Clooney, for example. Don't get that with women, do you? Um, it's not to say that men can't be depicted in ways that are there to objectify them, to sexualize them, but it's done in a different way. She says the idea that in mainstream culture, the visual and narrative codes that are used to construct the male body as spectacle differ from those used to objectify the female body. If we look at this issue of men's health, for example, here we've got a man who's very much showing off his body. He's, you know, he's being sexualized. He's depicting himself as a sex object, you know, as an ideal self, principally, but also as an ideal partner for any gay readers or potentially any females reading it or looking at it. But look at it. It says, get strong. Look at the way he's flexing his muscles to show off his muscles and his arms and his chest, the way he's turned like that. He is active, he is fit, he is, you know, strong, he stood up straight in a position of power. Compare this to the woman on the front cover of Cosmopolitan, for example. She's kneeling down. This is a, a position of submission. It makes her look weak. It makes her look powerless. You know, she's being objectified. But it's about the power that the the viewer has in relationship to the subject she's clearly submissive to us whereas the man on the front cover of men's health is dominant here we've got a spread from the inside of um, of men's health the same issue we just saw <clears throat> We've got a very definite sense of a male gaze here. We literally see a man gazing at a woman. Um, she is very much sexualized. I mean, who wears high platform heels to mow the lawn? Something which I should add is a stereotypically male task. Something you'd expect men to do. But here the idea that the woman is being subservient in this case and you know, doing a masculine job because the man can command her to do it. I grant you the man in this image looks subservient to the woman who does look quite uh, forceful and powerful but nonetheless there's still an element of sexism to it. What's perhaps even more disturbing is the, woman, the image from Cosmopolitan on the right. The life and times of a size 18 bunny girl. Obviously um you know, we're talking about here the the stereotype of the Playboy Bunny. Uh, quite topical in the week that Hugh Hefner died. Um, little known that Cosmopolitan was invented as a female equivalent of Playboy. And when it first started, it even had nude male centerfolds. But Reynolds was the first one. But here we've got an image which is clearly objectifying women. You know, reducing them to... You know, you, you can't even see their faces, they've got their back to us. Um, <clears throat> but it's also making a point here about body image. 
um, you know, you wouldn't get a size 18 bunny in reality, probably. Um, obviously, the woman is quite attractive in herself, but still, it's, you know, a very demeaning costume that she's wearing. You wouldn't expect that in a woman's magazine. Well, you'd like to think you wouldn't, anyway. These are both examples of Laura Mulvey's theory of the male gaze from 1975. She was specifically talking about the representation of women in film, but we can apply it to pretty much any media text. She says that the female body is objectified, literally turned into an object, in order to provide erotic male pleasure for the male viewer. Um, women will often be depicted in ways that are obviously sexualized. They'll be wearing very little clothing. Um, but the other thing was we tend to see them in roles that are submissive. Look at the way in which these women in this issue from XXL are represented as, you know, little better than possessions for little John. That, you know, like his, his necklace and his pimp cup, they're basically just state symbols of his power and wealth. Both these other images as well from Mix Mag and Rolling Stone are heavily sexualizing these women. You wouldn't expect to see, you know, someone like, you know, Bruce Springsteen on the front cover of Rolling Stone dressed like Lady Gaga is here, would you? Then we come to Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks was a black feminist writer which obviously brings in the racial element into feminism um on a, very, you know, on a basic feminism point she says that the idea of feminism is as a struggle to end sexist patriarchal oppression and the idea do, or the ideology of domination in a patriarchal society men are the ones with the power women are subservient to that for the vast majority of history until fairly recently in our, even our society women were treated as second-class citizens to the point of barely being even human they, you know a, a wife um, was basically the property of the husband literally he owned her and this is something that's only you know recently in the last hundred years probably changed and that's only in our society in other societies around the world it's still the case so, <clears throat> as this placard succinctly pointed, I've got 99 problems of white heteronormative patriarchy is all of them. Um, heteronormative, of course, we're talking about the idea of heterosexuality being considered the norm with other sexualities, homosexuality or bisexuality or asexuality, for example, being considered um, uh, aberrant, not normal. So basically, if you're a woman of color, if you're a woman, if you're a homosexual, you know, you are underdogs in society. If you happen to be all of the above, then, you know, you're at the bottom of the food chain. Bell Hooks also went on to say that the idea of race and class as well as sex determine the extent to which individuals exploited, discriminated against and oppressed. Um, gender and patriarchy are not the only issues affecting women. Obviously, social class and race are massive, massive elements in the way in which people are exploited and controlled. Uh, she says that women in lower class and poor groups, particularly those who are non-white, would not have defined women's liberation as women gaining social equality with men, since they continue to remind in their everyday life that all women do not share common social status. Basically, the point here is that she might be arguing that um, feminism, as we know it, is something of a, a middle-class bourgeois conceit. That, you know, if you are a white woman, yes, you are, you know, considered inferior to men in a patriarchal society but at least you still have considerable social power through your race and through your social class if you are black or any other person of color or even worse i suppose in this kind of point of view um, a woman as well that puts you very very far down the social structure so 
feminism for a, for a woman of colour can only do so much to give them a degree of equality. Bell Hooks also talks about the idea that feminism is a political commitment. It's not a lifestyle choice. You know, it's not a an affected attitude or behaviour. It's, it's political. Feminism is not an issue that only affects women. It affects everybody. It affects men as well. Men should be feminist just like women are. You know, you should, you know, We've all got mothers, we've all got sisters, we've all got, or some of us got daughters. You would expect your loved ones to be treated with dignity and respect. So, you know, feminism is something that affects all of us. If we want a fairer, more equal, more egalitarian society, then how can we afford not to be? Um, but as again, it ties in with that, you know, what she was saying before, that race and class as well as sex and gender determine the extent to which individuals are exploited and discriminated against or oppressed so they are all political issues and they're all intertwined you can't unhook one from the other um, here I should add we've got some fantastic images of women of colour standing up to the patriarchy heroes all I would say Um, an associated theory here we can have as well is from Kimberly Crenshaw she talks about this idea of intersexuality intersectionality I should say um, this is defined as the common point of two forms of oppression and how they work against a, a particular group of people so the term was particularly used to address black feminism so women are oppressed by the patriarchy Black people are, you know, oppressed by racism. If you are a black woman, you are doubly oppressed by both racism and misogyny. So, I would argue, of course, there's also the third element there as well of social class. Okay, that's a pretty quick rundown of the basic feminist theories. Um, I apologise for my crackly voice I do have a stinking cold at least I get to sound a little bit like Leonard Cohen though so if you've got any more questions please feel free to ask again sorry these are late being published but as you can see I've been feeling pretty miserable all weekend um, any questions you know where I am talk to you next time